Can I have your attention, please? Shh. That was good. That was better. Um, while, we, uh, con while you're continuing your meal, uh, we want to get things uh, going because we have a tight schedule tonight. Um, and, the, uh, uh, for, and the Secretary of State has agreed to join us for dinner, so she's down here now, and uh, leave her alone is my advice. But she is. That got our schedule moving. Um, let me start things rolling by introducing the Dean of the Newhouse School, a former journalist uh, at the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Baltimore Sun, uh, director of the School of Journalism at, uh, was a director of J School of Journalism at University of Texas at Austin. Um, but she, uh, fortunately for us, gave that up to come to Syracuse in 2008 and become Dean of the Newhouse School. And she's done a fantastic job. Ladies and gentlemen, Dean Lorraine Branham. Larry forgot to mention when uh, he introduced himself that he is also a proud alumnus of the Newhouse School, so. <laughs> but good evening and welcome. Thank you, Secretary Clinton, for being our guest tonight. I'm so delighted that so many of you were able to come out tonight to support the SI Newhouse School's Robin Toner Awards Program and its endowment, because yes, this is a fundraiser. Before I introduce our chancellor, I just wanted to take a moment to thank a few people on our end who helped to make this happen. Larry also already mentioned uh, Professor Charlotte Grimes, who worked to help me create this program several years ago. She retired from the university last year, but she continues to oversee the awards. I'd also like to thank Audrey Burian, our program assistant, who works on this project and its many moving parts from her perch in Syracuse. We really could not do this without her. Thank you, Audrey. And we thanked him once, but I, I have to thank again Syracuse University trustee John Chapel, who made the founding gift to this endowment and continues to support the program. Thank you, John. <laughs> and last, but by no means least, because I don't know if anyone will thank him tonight, I have to thank Peter Gosselin. He truly has been the guiding spirit behind this program. And you'll hear a bit from him later, but I have to tell you, Peter put so much time and effort into the fundraising part of this project, you'd think he worked for Syracuse University. And I assure you, he does not. <laughs> However, we would not have our guest speaker, this lovely venue, so many of our sponsors without his tireless effort and dedication to this cause. As you might imagine, for him it's a labor of love, but we are very appreciative of his efforts. And he's been an amazing partner in this endeavor and has worked closely with both Charlotte and I over the past five years to make this program as successful as it has been. So thank you, Peter, for all you've done for the program, for Newhouse, and for its students. I'd now like to introduce our chancellor, Kent Severud, who became the 12th chancellor and president of Syracuse University in January 2014. He brought with him nearly two decades of academic leadership and experience at premier national universities, most recently serving as dean and the Ethan A. H. Shepley Distinguished University Professor at the School of Law at Washington University in St. Louis. Prior to that, he served as Dean at Vanderbilt Law School and as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the University of Michigan Law School. He's held numerous national leadership positions as well. Since 2010, he served as one of two independent trustees of the Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill Trust. And I'm sure all of you in the room know about that disaster and the fact that you know, they were busy paying out claims from that devastating oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. He's also served as the president of the American Law School Deans Association, chair of the board of the Law School Admissions Council, and editor of the Journal of Legal Education. Chancellor Severud is also an award-winning teacher in his own right and a member of the College of Law and the School of Education faculties at Syracuse University. 
Tonight, he is accompanied by his wife, Dr. Ruth Chen, an accomplished environmental toxicologist who is a professor of practice in Syracuse University's College of Engineering and Computer Science. Please join me in welcoming to the podium our Chancellor, Professor Kent Severud. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure for Ruth and me to welcome you tonight to celebrate our renowned journalist and our alumna, Robin Toner. I, I also want to thank and recognize so many people, including our great dean, Lorraine Branham, uh, and also Peter and Jacob and Nora Gosselin and John Chappell for their vision in establishing this award, and all the staff at the Newhouse School that put this event together. One outcome of great journalism is to provide people with the information to be free and self-governing. Robin Toner was known for her high-quality, fact-based, and accessible and clear journalism. She launched a career that would become legendary using a strong foundation of skills and experience gained from her Syracuse education. She was the first female national political correspondent at the New York Times, a job she relished and that was exceptionally suited to her. She illuminated the electoral process, revealed the politics of policy, and engaged the public in democracy. She made the intricate details of policies understandable and enabled voters to make informed decisions. Uh, her husband and John Chapel, Syracuse trustee and Robin's classmate, established this prize in 2009 to encourage the same kind of reporting that Robin did. And in just five years, the Toner Prize has become one of the most prestigious awards for political reporters. As we're gonna see shortly, when the prize is awarded to this year's recipient, Robin's brand of journalism is thriving. Tonight's celebration serves in many ways to inspire the next generation of Robin Toners, a select group of whom are here. Uh, there are students here from the Newhouse School of Public Communications and from the Public Diplomacy Program in the Maxwell Schools. And so I'd like those students to stand and be recognized. We're, of course, terrifically honored to have with us here tonight former Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. Secretary Clinton has frequently made history during her long career in public service. She served as the 67th Secretary of State of the United States from 2009 until 2013. After nearly four decades as an advocate, an attorney, a first lady, and a senator. As first lady, she advocated for health care reform, and led successful bipartisan efforts to improve adoption and foster care systems, to reduce teen pregnancy, to establish early head start, and to provide health care to millions of children through the Children's Health Insurance Program. In 2000, Secretary Clinton made history as the first former first lady elected to the United States Senate. As a senator from New York, she worked across party lines to expand economic opportunity and access to quality, affordable health care. In 2007 and 2008, Secretary Clinton made a historic campaign for president, winning 18 million votes and more primaries and delegates than any woman had before. In her four years as Secretary of State, Secretary Clinton played a central role in restoring America's standing in the world and strengthening its global leadership. She traveled to more than 80 countries as a representative of the United States, winning respect as a champion of women's rights, human rights, democracy, civil society, and opportunities for women and girls around the world. Today, through the Bill, Hillary, and Chelsea Clinton Foundation, Secretary Clinton builds on the nonprofit work she began nearly four decades ago. And she is a potential presidential contender in 2016. So. Just a word about the connections between Secretary Clinton and Robin Toner. In her work at the New York Times, Robin Toner covered much of Secretary Clinton's career, including her efforts while First Lady in the early 1990s to overhaul the nation's healthcare system. 
It was over this issue that Robin, Toner, and Peter Gosselin met as competitors. Secretary Clinton wrote the couple a con congratulatory message upon their marriage in 1996, and then wrote them again upon the birth of their children in 1997. Peter recalls that her note said, upon the marriage and then the twins' birth, at least something good came from health care reform. <laughs> Secretary Clinton's presidential campaign in 2007 and 2008 was among the very last of Robin's reporting. She passed away in December 2008, shortly after the presidential election. It is my great honor to welcome, on behalf of Syracuse University and the Newhouse School, Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am uh, really honored uh, to be here. I want to thank uh, Chancellor, Dr. Chen, everyone associated with Syracuse University. I was privileged when I was senator from New York to spend a lot of time at the university to spend uh, some really uh, great hours talking about uh, the work that is done there, and I'm delighted to be here to support uh, the Newhouse School and Robin's uh, legacy uh, that invests in the future of serious, substantive uh, public uh, journalism. Uh, just a few minutes ago, I had a chance to meet uh, the journalism students, and I was delighted to see the next generation uh, on the way. Um, but I am well aware that some of you may be a little surprised uh, to see me here tonight. Um, you know, my relationship with the press has been, at times, shall we say, complicated. And when Peter asked if I wanted to spend an evening with a room full of political reporters, I thought to myself, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it didn't take long to accept, but then, of course, I've been ruminating about it. <laughs> but I am all about new beginnings. A new grandchild, another new hairstyle, <laughs> a new email account. <laughs> Why not a new relationship with the press? So here goes. No more secrecy. No more zone of privacy. After all, what good did that do me? But First of all, before I go any further, if you look under your chairs, you'll find a simple non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> My attorneys drew it up. Old habits last. <laughs> but I am certainly aware that public figures can't complain about coverage. Uh, we don't like if we don't give credit where credit is certainly due. And that's why I'm here to join all of you in supporting the kind of journalism that Robin loved and exemplified and that so many of you uh, work hard to do every day. Uh, journalism that informs our debates, educates our citizens, and makes it possible to base public policy decisions on evidence rather than ideology. So I want to thank all of you who have helped to make this program possible, uh, including uh, John Chappell, Gwen Eiffel, and Adam Clymer. I also want to recognize Lieutenant Governor of the State of New York, uh, Kathy Hochul, who's here, and she has already been twisting arms in the legislature. Uh, so you'll notice she, hers is broken, but that's all in the pursuit of the public interest. But mostly, I'm here because I really admired uh, Robin. I admired her 
uh, approach toward covering uh, the events that I was involved in directly, uh, starting in the 1992 uh, presidential campaign, when she covered that campaign, uh, wrote a little bit about me and my journey through that uh, time, to the very last interview that I had with her in September of 2007. Uh, it was about health care. I had just rolled out my health care policy for the presidential campaign. And we had a long, substantive conversation about what I had learned, what the country had learned uh, from the 93, 94 experience, what could be done, and how best to organize uh, health care reform going forward. But I also am here because I am so grateful uh, that uh, Peter asked me, and I have a chance uh, to see them, uh, Peter, Jake, and Nora, and thank them uh, for being so involved in this prize and what it means. Uh, the idea that uh, they are actually uh, contributing to helping other reporters, reporters uh, get the recognition that they deserve is incredibly meaningful uh, to me and to so many of you. In fact, I learned that Nora actually is the editor-in-chief of her school paper. Um, <laughs> I'm told she's leading a transition to digital and mobile <laughs> while insisting on high quality content across <laughs> platforms. She's probably getting ready to meerkat us at any moment. And of course, Jake is the captain and star of the cross country team. And, um, Uh, the, the two of them will head off into uh, the world to, to go to college next year, carrying with them uh, so many lessons that uh, their parents have instilled in them and determined to make their own marks. And I am uh, thrilled to uh, be part of this evening with them. So when I first got to know Robin in the 92 campaign, which you know some of you might remember had a few ups and downs, came out the right way. That's sort of the best way for a story to end, in my opinion. Um, I saw a reporter who really liked to delve into the substance of issues. And that was particularly meaningful to me, being kind of a policy person myself. And I saw that again during the health care reform debates in 93 and 94. Um, Chancellor's absolutely right. Uh, the best thing that came out of those two years was Peter and Robin uh, getting together, brought together by covering the uh, arc of our efforts. They disagreed, actually. I think Peter was somewhat more optimistic. Uh, than Robin was, but in all the partisan back and forth about health care, it was easy to lose sight of what was really at stake, and Robin never did that. She understood that the debate fundamentally was about lowering costs, improving quality, and expanding coverage for Americans. The details were complicated, and she immersed herself in them, but she understood that the details really mattered. And she was one of the best at explaining all of it in terms that her readers could understand. The Columbia Journalism Review once described Robin's approach as digging beyond the obvious to provide insights into other forces at work that ultimately may shape, debate, or affect an outcome. That's what her career represents to me as someone who was both an observer and a reader, as well as an occasional subject. From her start covering coal miners in West Virginia through her 25-year barrier-breaking career at the Times, she really set a high standard. She was relentless in pursuit of a story, and 
She had this look, Peter, which you probably can recall, when she was interviewing you in person, and either you weren't doing a very good job of explaining what she was asking you, or she was not buying it, <laughs> and she just kind of peered at you, and then hammered into those questions, not in an aggressive way, and just a kind of like, well, how would that really work? Because after all, if you suppress this area of cost, then it's probably going to pop up over here, and what are you going to do about that? She always puts you on the spot, but in a way that you felt was totally fair. It was a search for understanding. She brought balance to her writing. Uh, she understood that uh, we were all trying to figure out how to make uh, sense out of these difficult issues. And I appreciated that even if sometimes it was my stumbles and setbacks that she was sharing with the world, it was always in a context that I could recognize and make sense of. She's not been gone very long, but I think it's gotten even harder to do the kind of journalism that she did. Every day, you, the reporters, the writers in this room, are under more and more pressure from changes in technology, in the marketplace, and of course, in our politics. You're facing fundamental questions that may not fit into 140 characters, but are nonetheless vital to our democracy. I think the stakes are really high. Too many of our most important debates occur in what I call an evidence-free zone. Ideology trumping facts, made-for-cable shout fests, Twitter storms drowning out substantive dialogue and reporting that too often leads to shallower, more contentious politics and either no or not the best public policy. I think it's important that as the media landscape fractures and there's the rise of more overtly partisan and ideological news outlets, that we rely even more on reporters to try to get us out of the echo chambers we all inhabit. So it's pretty clear that you know, I believe we need more Robin Toners. More reporters who can cut through the noise and get to the hard truths that matter. And we need more prizes that really recognize those who try and succeed. To look no further than the issue that Robin mastered, you can see that in the current debate about health care. Today is the fifth anniversary of the Affordable Care Act. And over these five years, we've heard plenty of scare tactics, wild claims about socialism and death panels, but not nearly enough about how to keep expanding access, lowering costs, and improving quality. These are complicated but very consequential questions. Why is it, for example, that healthcare costs for our economy as a whole are finally slowing down, but out-of-pocket costs for many American families are still rising. Is it, at least in part, because too many pharmaceutical companies take advantage of the lack of competition to charge Americans the highest prices in the world? Is it really possible that the Supreme Court will decide to strip more than seven million people of their ability to pay for health insurance? What will the new Republican plan to end Medicare as we know it mean for middle class families? These are critical questions and their answers will impact tens of millions of Americans. And so we should be exploring those, but at the same time trying to ask ourselves how to improve the Affordable Care Act, how to build on the successes 16 million Americans have gotten coverage. Millions of young people are able to stay on their parents' plans. Insurance companies can no longer discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions or charge women higher rates just because of our gender. 
Innovations are actually moving us toward a better model based on the quality of care instead of the quantity. That is an important record and one that there is a lot to be proud of. But there's so much more to do to protect people from high drug costs and insurance company abuses, to simplify and streamline, to ease burdens on small businesses, to extend the bipartisan children's health insurance program. I'm well aware none of this will be easy, but it will be impossible if we don't have people like those in this room explaining what's at stake. What are our blind spots? We all have them. Where could we try to find common ground? What do we do after the Supreme Court decides, regardless of which way they go? So we need more than ever smart, fair-minded journalists to challenge our assumptions, push us toward new solutions, and hold all of us accountable. Now, I don't want to get carried away here. Those of us on the other side are not always going to be happy about whatever it is you do. But we do understand, in our more rational moments, that is your job. <laughs> and we and our democracy depend on you. That's why the Toner Prize is so important. And I am grateful that you are keeping Robin's legacy and her reporting and her standards of quality alive and more relevant than ever. Because of you, Robin's work, her example, goes on. And we are all better off because of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Clinton. What's not to love about that? <laughs> um, now we're going to uh, move on to the other reason we're here, um, the heart of the program, awarding the Toner Prize. In just uh, a few short years, the prize has succeeded in recognizing some of the very best political journalism um, in the country and some of the best political reporters. The four previous winners, are Craig Harris of the Arizona Republic, Jane Mayer of The New Yorker, who's with us tonight, um, Molly Ball of The Atlantic, and uh, someone else who's with us tonight, Karen Tumulty of The Washington Post. So next up is a, a former colleague and editor of Robbins at The New York Times, for nearly a quarter of a century. Uh, Adam Clymer was a good friend of hers, a friend uh, to her family, and a generous contributor to the Toner program. He's also been a final judge for all five of the Toner prizes. Adam, by the way, is a legendary reporter in his own right. He's probably best remembered for an incident during the 2000 presidential campaign when then candidate for President George W. Bush was caught on an unfortunately live mic, that happens, Secretary Clinton, I don't know, um, uh, whispering to his running mate, Dick Cheney, there's Adam Clymer, major league asshole from the New York Times. <laughs> Adam will share some of his insights and experiences into this year's entries and what they show about the state of American political journalism. Well, Larry obviously Googled me. <laughs> I mean, no, nobody else remembers. Actually, my reaction was to think of Mark Twain, who cited a character who was tarred, feathered, and ridden out of town on a rail. And his reaction was, well, except for the honor of it, I'd have sooner walked. <laughs> it's been a great pleasure to judge these contests to help shape this award for, for five years. We've had a a continuing expansion of interest. This year we had 165 entries, which is far more than ever before. 
Uh, I'm struck by all of the different things that news organizations, and some of them with big budgets like the Times or the Post, and some of them like with very small budgets, have found ways to do, um, covering things like the techniques of politics, money, uh, data mining, all of these great adventures that computers bring us. Um, I'm struck sometimes that there may not be quite enough of focusing on the impact of these elections on policy, which is what Robin did best. When Robin and Robert Pear and I covered the Clinton health care program in 1994, as the secretary suggested, we tried very hard to keep the word Clinton off the front page of the story. We weren't really interested in whether it was a success or a defeat for the president and the first lady. If it had passed, it would have been a success. We all know that. But we were interested in how it impacted people. And uh, that's a worth, worthy thing for reporters to do. And we've got a winner tonight, whom you probably read about. I'll, I'll leave it to the Nora Gosselin to explain it. But before then, this has been a, a good event, a big, a big success, the biggest we've had, and we're moving on. And let me turn this mo microphone over to Jake Gosselin to carry on. Those of you who have attended uh, previous events know that every year my sister and I have the honor of presenting the Toner Prize. We alternate who gets to award the actual prize with each event, and since I had the privilege of presenting it to Karen Tumblety last year, today it is my sister's turn. Which raised the interesting question last week when I began writing the speech of what exactly I was supposed to say. <laughs> After a bit of discussion with my dad, I decided that I would use this time to say a few words about what this program has meant to both me and my sister over the past six years. For those of you who don't know, both Nora and I had to endure the college application process this year. And because we were both lucky enough to be accepted early admission, we recently received a barrage of congratulations from friends and family. Congratulations that are almost inevitably followed by the phrase, your mom would be so proud. That phrase has always held a huge amount of significance to me. Because the question it answers, the question of whether mom would be proud, is one that I think both me and my sister have asked ourselves a lot over the years. There's a two-part tragedy that accompanies losing a parent at a young age. And the first part is that they never get to see the person you become, leaving you with this constant small doubt about whether you've lived up to their expectations. The second part is, to a certain extent, you get to never see the person they were. When I was 11, I knew my mom was a journalist, but to me, she was just my mom. The idea of her having a job and a life that didn't revolve around me was impossible to comprehend. <laughs> and that's where this program has come into play. As I was writing this speech last night, I looked through some of the old transcripts from previous events in search of inspiration, and I found a speech my dad gave at the first Toner Prize. In it, he talked about how this program would, quote, remind Jake and Nora, should they forget as time passes, that their mother was someone to reckon with in her chosen field. And in doing so, make them ask through the years, what would she have thought? What would she have believed? What would she have hoped? What would she have loved? Over the past six years, this program has served to remind me and Nora of the legacy my mom left behind, a legacy we couldn't really understand when she passed when we were 11. It has given us the chance to see who she was as a writer, as a reporter, and as a person. And for that, both of us are eternally grateful to everyone here. Thank you. Good evening. I want to join Jake in thanking all of you for being here tonight. Each year, I am simply overwhelmed by the passion and commitment of this group. Each year, I am reminded of what an honor this program and prize are for me, my family, and for the memory of my mom. 
As Jake mentioned, he and I both endured the grueling college process this past fall. The testing, the applications, the endless waiting and worrying. For one of my very first essays, I was asked to write about what defined me, what over the course of my life has made me the person I am today. And as I sat there, startled by the sheer enormity of this question, I kept returning to one thing, coming back to one aspect of my 18 years. And that's growing up in a newsroom. But it's not the formal bring your kids to work days or the specific bylines or any of mom's endless treks to Iowa that I remember most clearly. No, it's the little things that stand out all these years later. Adam Clymer's spontaneous Friday afternoon toasts where I sipped my glass of grape juice and felt like such an adult. The reporter's notebooks I was allowed to fill with my own news stories, which my mom then edited. The singing moosehead next to Adam Nagurney's desk that absolutely terrified me. It's these little things that made me feel like part of an enormous, enduring newsroom family. A family that taught me what conviction and dedication are. A family that pulled together when mom was sick, bringing meals to our house each night. A family that made me the person I am today. Tonight we honor a reporter who has been part of that newsroom family for 45 years. His entries painted thoughtful and complex political portraits of the key players on both the Democratic and Republican sides. From carefully analyzing Thad Cochran's strategy in the Mississippi GOP runoff race to covering the shifting dynamics of the Democratic Party in preparation for the post-Obama election, this writer illuminated and contextualized the political figures of today. The nuance, insight, and engagement of his pieces was so completely unparalleled that runner-ups were not even selected, a first in the history of this prize. Therefore, it is my great honor to award this year's Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting to Dan Balls of the Washington Post. Thank you. Please, thank you very much. Um, Secretary Clinton, thank you for continuing to sit here through this. I didn't expect that you were going to be here. I'm, I'm happy to yield my time back to you if you want to take some questions. Uh, Nora and Jake, thank you. Uh, this is really a very special award for me. Um, I'm honored, I'm humbled uh, to have won a prize named after someone whom I so admired uh, when we worked together on the beat for many, many years. Um, and honestly, winning this award, as Charlotte Grimes will tell you, was a complete surprise. Uh, the truth is I was not going to enter this year. Um, I had entered every year so far. <laughs> And there's only so much rejection a person my age can take. Um, uh, the deadline came at an awkward time. I was on the road. Uh, I was with Phil Rucker out in California at the RNC meeting. And Stephen Ginsburg uh, said, you should, you know, we want to enter. We want an entry from you. And I thought, all right, but there's no way the Washington Post is going to get this award twice in a row. My inestimable colleague, Karen Tumulty, won it last year, deservedly so, and I thought, I thought, there's no way the post gets two. Um, and so I said, all right, I will enter. I said this to Stephen, uh, but I said, I know I will not win, uh, and I will buy you a dinner if I am proved wrong. So Stephen, this may be the dinner you get, or, <laughs> or, I, may, or I may yet owe you another one. Uh, you know, if 90% of, of life is showing up, certainly a significant part of winning an award is entering. So <laughs> let, that, let that be my one piece of advice to you. Um, I have a lot of people to thank tonight for this. Um, and I want to start with my wife, Nancy. We, we met as college students many, many years ago. Um, we have been married now almost 46 years. 
And um, this award, like so many other things, would not be possible without your love and support. Thank you. Um, thank you also to everybody at Syracuse and, and, the, and the Newhouse School, uh, Dean Branham, Charlotte Grimes, John, for your generous contributions. Um, everybody who oversees this program keeps Robin's flame burning brightly, and those of us who knew her as well as I did uh, very much appreciate that. Uh, thank you also to Peter Goslin for creating this award, uh, to Jake and Nora for being the living embodiment of what and who Robin was. Um, and I've also learned over the years it's dangerous to follow any of the Goslin family to the podium, but I will labor on. Um, I want to thank a lot of people at the Post. Um, we brought a cheering section tonight, just in case. <laughs> Marty Barron and Kevin Merida have, uh, are, are leading a great newsroom and have brought us back after some difficult years, and, and we are all grateful for that. Um, <laughs> I mentioned Steven Ginsburg, our senior political editor. We have a lot of other political editors, who, some of whom are here, Cameron Barr, Scott Wilson, Ann Kornblut, Dan Egan, Terry Samuel, Rebecca Sinderbrand, and others who keep our political coverage operating. We have more political editors than a lot of places have political reporters at this point, um, but they're great. But I want to give a special thanks to the reporters that I work with every day. Uh, with whom I am in the trenches and who make our coverage as vibrant as it is. Um, it, is a, it is a pleasure to watch this team of ours crank into high gear when something happens. Um, and some days I just want to sit back and watch rather than actually report it myself, but uh, they won't allow me to do that. So uh, when he was alive, Dave Broder instilled a culture of collegiality uh, to the post-political coverage. Um, it has always been a team effort and it continues to be that way and, and uh, I, I've been lucky to be a part of it for a long time. Uh, as I said, there's something especially gratifying about winning an award named for Robin Toner. She was a friend and a competitor. Uh, we shared a lot of miles and a lot of meals together, uh, covering presidential politics and other things over the years. You've already heard from Secretary Clinton about her talents and her gifts. Uh, I would echo all of that. She was smart. She was generous, she was tenacious, she was gracious, she had tremendously high standards. I remember at one of these dinners a few years ago, a friend of hers from college days repeated a comment that Robin had made when she was an aspiring journalist. Never settle, she said, and she never did, and for that we're grateful. Um, Robin is a reminder to all of us, all of us in this room who are practitioners of this craft, uh, of what rep political reporting can be and should be. Uh, we spend a lot of time writing about the horse race in politics, and I'm as guilty as everybody else because we all love the horse race. Um, but it is a small part of political reporting. It's not just, campaign coverage is not just about who's up today or down tomorrow, or chasing shiny objects, or being clever on Twitter. It's about much bigger things, as Robin always reminded us. It's about the character and records of the candidates who want to be president as much as it is who leads the polls in Iowa and New Hampshire. It's about what an election says about the changing forces at work across our country, about the hopes and dreams of voters rather than the ambitions, rather than the ambitions of the candidates. And today, it is also about tribal politics and the yawning gulf between red and blue America. Robin's work, if anybody who's here hasn't read it, they should go back and read it, reminds us that political reporting is not just the coverage of campaigns. She understood the importance of the intersection between policy and politics, and I fear that too often we highlight the politics at the expense of the policies. I know I'm guilty of that, but campaigns, after all, are a means to an end, not an end in themselves. I am also lucky to have won this award this year for another reason. Over the last half dozen years, there has been a major generational shift in the political reporting cadre who are doing national politics. People of my generation, those of us who are left, are being supplanted by a newer, younger group of reporters. I see this at the Post every day, working with some amazing young reporters, and I see it when I am out on the trail trying to keep up 
with everyone, a lot of whom are in this room. There's a tremendous amount of talent in the young group covering politics today, and I marvel at what you all are doing across many platforms. One thing I've learned over many years is that you have to reinvent yourself in one way or another for every campaign cycle. And all of you in the young generation have helped me redouble my own efforts to produce the best work that I can. Which leaves me with a parting thought, courtesy again of Dave Broder. A long time ago, he talked about how the lessons learned from one campaign rarely apply to the next. He said it was often the case that the reporter who was spot on in one campaign could be as dumb as you know what in the next campaign. <laughs> and with that in mind, I happily accept this award knowing f <laughs> knowing full well that we are only as good as our next story. It's been a wonderful night. Tomorrow it's back to work. Thank you very much. What a terrific night. And what a fantastic winner. I had the extreme pleasure of working with Dan during my tenure at The Post. I started at The Post as a reporter in 77, and Dan came just a few months later. Um, he was one of the smartest, most talented, and nicest people I'd ever met and ever had the privilege to work with. Secretary Clinton, I, I hope you heard that story about what can happen if you just keep entering over and over again. <laughs> Uh, of course, when I knew Dan, when I knew Dan, he didn't need all those editors to work on his copy. It just stuff just went in. I don't, I don't know what was. And uh, Jake and Nora, I wanted to thank you. And Jake, that was a cool tie. Where are you? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. This, for those of you who don't know, is a. Uh, this was a, the tie we gave out at the dedication of Newhouse Three at Syracuse, which, besides that being the lovely color of orange. Uh, has the First Amendment all over it, which is the building does as well. That was great. Thank you for honoring us with that. Um, so let me just say, um, uh, thank our sponsors one more time, John Chapel, USA Today, Bloomberg, Google, and Pharma. And let me thank, finally, uh, for all of this and, and for creating this event, um, uh, Peter Gosselin, who did a fantastic job. And I think it's... Um, I think uh, it's only fitting uh, for Peter to come up here and give the benediction for us. Thank all of you for coming and for supporting this program, which is still finding its sea legs. I owe a debt of gratitude to all of you. I owe a debt of gratitude to Secretary Clinton. I, I read the stories that this, I was blessed with her being willing to do this program because this is a women's month. You have a series of events about women. But I, I actually, I would posit that at least part of the reason she agreed to this is because she's a mother and because she realizes what it means for kids to lose a mother. And finally, I'm incredibly grateful to my kids. When you get out this far from a death, people say things like, so get over it. And the fact is that you don't get over it. You get on with it. You grow, but you don't get over it. But getting on with it is a great thing. And Nora and Jake are living embodiments of that. I, I'm, I'm well aware and I'm particularly aware now that I've come back after a detour through um, the administration that uh, back to journalism that these have been very hard years. Uh, I am stunned at how much has changed um, that I'm supposed to tweet, which I 
still can't figure out what to say in 140 characters. I can't throw them clear my throat in more than 15 <laughs> tweets. But I'd just say that uh, Nora and Jake uh, offer us reporters a lesson in we're not going to get over what we lost, but we can get on with it. And we are getting on with it. And I hope that this program in some small way helps us get on with the enterprise that's so important, which is maintaining what's so great about fact-based quality journalism that covers both the politicians but also the policy. See you next year.